wanted to uh, welcome everyone uh, tonight. Uh, my name is Don Barry. I chair the Physical Sciences Department here at Mesa College, and I help coordinate the, uh, the STEM lecture series along with uh, both speakers tonight and uh, Dr. Kevin Crown. So we're really happy uh, you're here. Just out of curiosity, uh, are most of you from Mesa? No. no. Okay. Where, where else? What other schools do we have represented tonight? City College. Where? City College. City College. Great. Anyone from Grossmont? Woohoo! Anywhere else? Miramar? Great. Stanford? <laughs> okay, good deal. All right. Well, we're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, with the recent uh, mission to uh, Pluto, the, uh, the solar system uh, ha has really become an interesting place again. So uh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, both of our speakers, and then I'll invite uh, the first one to come up. Uh, Dr. Uh, Elena Stoymirovich is uh, uh, a tenure-track astronomer uh, here in the Physical Sciences Department of Mesa College, and Professor Dave Coleman has, uh, has been with the department for uh, many years, and they're going to tag team it tonight. So uh, please, uh, please give a warm welcome to our speakers, and we're going to kick things off with uh, Dr. Stoymirovich. Hi, as always, pleasure to be here. I don't know where to stand though, maybe like here for the beginning and then I'll start walking around. Um, okay, so there are so many things to talk about the solar system that I'm gonna jump like right onto the topics, okay? So initially we wanted to talk about more things, but as we started preparing, we had to cut down because there are so many things going on in the solar system and many of them are really interesting and uh, aim to push our limits of knowledge like even more. So, uh, so far we had actually more than 40 space missions dedicated to exploring the solar system. And in addition, we use the telescopes on the ground as well to search for the solar system, uh, properties of the solar system. But there are so many things that we still don't know about the solar system, and some of them are actually related to the formation of the giant planet. So the reason why we selected Juno mission to talk about, because Juno will try to tackle some of those questions, how the big planets formed in solar system. Then also, usually this is the picture of the solar system that we have in the textbook. So like, you know, eight planets and then a bunch of like dwarf planets over here. And then there are some asteroids and comets. But this picture is kind of a really now like, let's say, old picture because solar system is much more complex system than what you would see on that first picture. So in the center is the sun, and then we have four terrestrial planets over here that you can see. And then there is asteroid belt around them. And you actually have to now compress all of this zoom, let's put it actually over here, to see what else is out there in the solar system. And what else is in the solar system are four outer planets or giant planets. This kind of a weird looking orbit belongs to Pluto, right? So that's the dwarf planet. And as you can see now, there is another swarm over here of a lot of like icy objects. This is the Kuiper belt now. This is where Pluto belongs. And Pluto now is not the only object there, although it took us a while to find other objects that belong to the Kuiper belt. And so uh, my other part of the talk today will be potential ninth planet in our solar system, which actually would be even beyond the Kuiper Belt object. It would go further than the Kuiper Belt and then come back over here. This is a new announcement, comes in like you know a few months ago in this year, so this is actually really exciting. For a long time we had nine planets and then people felt sad for Pluto, but maybe now we will get the ninth planet <laughs> kind of a back, right? And so this is exciting, although it's still kind of a very like up in the air and we are looking for that planet, but I'll try to explain you uh, how that all works. So outside now, if you put all of this that we know about in the little dot, surrounding uh, this dot is the Oort cloud. This is now a vast region that uh, encompasses the rest of the solar system, and occasionally we get visitors from this part of the solar system, and those would be like uh, comets that uh, very occasionally come to the inner part of the solar system. So I'll start by giving you the overview of how stars form and exploring how common or not common really the solar systems are. So 
Our theory about the star formation and then planetary formation as well is called the nebular theory. The basics of these theories are that there are huge clouds of gas and dust that sit out in the space and maybe for most of the time they don't do anything, but then something triggers them to start collapsing and as they collapse, you can see over here they're going to flatten and make these uh, disk shapes. The most of the mass is going to be in the center of the disk and that's where the star will be forming. If we look now at our solar system, that is correct for our solar system, 99.9% .9 of all of the mass that we see in the solar system is actually in the sun. So when you think about it, just like 1,000 part of all of the mass that it's in the solar system ended up in all of the planets, asteroids, comets, and the other stuff. Everything is in the sun. And sun is actually huge. Here is one surface feature that we can see on the sun, and here is Earth for the comparison. So Earth is very, very tiny compared to how huge the sun is. Another thing that we said in the previous slide is that the planets form in this disk <coughs> that, uh, that rotates. When we say the disk, we think something that is like really thin and then uh, rotates in one direction. And we have evidence for that in our solar system, or let's say the evidence from our solar system has inspired they thought, that thought. The sun rotates counterclockwise as you look, and then all of the planets also go counterclockwise around the sun. And all of the planets, or most of them, are also going to rotate around their own axis counterclockwise. So that supports this idea that all of the planets formed in the disk that initially rotates around the sun, um, around the sun. How common are solar system or planetary systems? They're actually very, very common. We think that every single star, when it forms, forms basically with this disk around itself. So every single star should have planets around itself. And so very soon the Orion will be coming up. It's the winter constellation. And so if you see the Orion below the Orion belt, there is Orion Nebula. You can see it as a fuzzy uh, part of the sky. And just in this region uh, of the sky, in the Orion Nebula, Hubble Space Telescope has found more than 30 future solar systems. So 30 stars forming with the disks around them. And so here you can see little zoom-ins into those stars. They all form the same way. The star in the center, the disk around, and the disk rotates. And in the disk you can form, or the planets can form. Now, how do planets form in this disk? This is important because our Juno mission will kind of challenge maybe these ideas. In this disk around the star, we think that planets form kind of from the seeds. The seeds that will make the planets are made out of the metal, rock, or maybe some kind of ice compounds. So what happens, they start kind of a condensing and grouping together. And then as they grow, they move now through this disk. As they move through the disk, because they're now a little bit bigger, they have the ability to plow through the disk and basically grow by that process. We call that process the accretion process. And so we know that, um, so is there evidence for that? This is the most amazing picture that we have and the most detailed picture that we have from a star forming. So here is the star forming. It's called the HL Tauri star. And then all of these gaps over here that you see, the empty regions are actually planets in their formation. These protoplanets that are moving through the disk and sweeping the material and growing in size, but clearing out the disk. This is the phase we think the sun went through and the solar system went through early in its formation. This was taken by the interferometer. Maybe you heard, my students heard ALMA interferometer. So this is the one in Chile, and it's the super good resolution of the images. That's why we can actually see all of these details. Now, in the solar system, we have two types of planets. Uh, one type are Earth-like planets or terrestrial planets, kind of a rocky, small world. And then we also have big planets or Jovian planets. And they're actually sometimes called gas giants. They don't really look like the terrestrial planets. They're mostly made out of the hydrogen and helium. So we think we understand why we have two different types of planets. And we also think that this should be a common case in any other planetary system. The reason why we have two different types of planets has to do with basically where planets form with respect to the sun. <laughs> so most of the solar nebula, that cloud that the sun and the planets form from, was made out of the hydrogen and helium. So when you look around yourself, Actually, what we see around is not really typical of the solar nebula. That's not the typical composition we find there. 
That is not also typical about the universe. The universe is mostly hydrogen and helium, but that is not really present on the Earth or any other planet that is close to the sun. The reason has to do a little bit with physics. So you can see over here these big squares tell you uh, these different kind of a chemical elements or compounds and how represented they were initially in the solar nebula. Most of the stuff was hydrogen and helium, 98% by mass or 99.9% .9 by the number of atoms. And then we have a little bit less of the hydrogen compounds, only 1.4% by mass. Then there was rocky stuff, so silicates and so on, that was less than 1%. And then the metals over here were even less. What is different about these different uh, chemical elements is what are the temperatures at these pressures in the solar nebula at which they will condense? And that means like, at what temperatures they can go from the gas state into the solid state. And you need that because you want to make those little kind of a chunks of the matter on which more will come on and that will grow to become a planet. So what we can see very close to the sun, it is going to be actually quite hot. So there is no way that hydrogen and helium will condense. They actually don't tend to condense at all unless it's the extreme pressure. The hydrogen compounds as well, they need really low temperatures. So close to the sun, the only things really that can go into the solid phase are the rocks and the metals. And that's the reason why we actually have these planets that are close to the sun are mostly made out of the <coughs> rocks and metals. And we actually uh, think that all of the water on the Earth was brought later on by the comet. So it was not there when the Earth formed. Okay, so this is now the picture that summarizes all of this that we said. So if you look over here at these little blobs that will make the planets, closer to the sun, the sun is forming over here, that's why it's called the proto-sun, it's not yet the sun, we will actually have really small planets because the only things that goes into the solid phase is going to be the rock and the metal and there is not too much of that in the solar nebula. Further over here in the cooler parts of the solar system, we are going to have not just the rock and metals, but also hydrogen compounds condensing. So this is going to initially grow much faster. And as it goes through the disk, it's going to be able to sweep more stuff onto it. And then it's going to become gravitationally big, so it can even pull more stuff on top of it. And that's the reason why we are going to have big planets over here and very small planets close to the, close to the sun. Okay. And so this takes approximately 100 million years to form terrestrial type planets. It's not, for, for our kind of a time scales, it's like a long time, but for the, for the stars and for the planets, this is like goes really quick, basically. So they form quickly within 100 million years. And uh, then what happens over here, what the theory tells <laughs> is that these big planets are able to capture a lot of the gas that it's available, hydrogen and helium, and that's why Jupiter is actually really big. The core of the Jupiter is only like 10 times bigger than the, than the Earth itself, but it has 300, uh, 300 Earth masses in hydrogen and helium on top of that. That is our current theory that we have about the, the formation of the planets. It takes another like half a billion years for the solar system to get cleaned up from all of the debris and we have actually, so initially the solar system is a very violent place and you see that because of all of the presence of the craters on the moon, Mercury and Mars. They came later on uh, through these collisions that we have in the early solar system. Okay, so here is my first topic, Juno over here and let's see how Juno will try to challenge this uh, picture that we have about the star formation. So Juno was launched in uh, 2011, and it just this July actually arrived into the orbit around Jupiter. This is the fastest ever man-made spaceship. When it entered the orbit, it had this speed, 265,000 kilometers per hour. It will have very interesting orbit. It is going to come very close to Jupiter, like three, 3,000 miles, and then it's also going to go really far away from Jupiter, approximately like 1 million miles away from Jupiter. And it's going to spend like 18 months doing this, going around Jupiter. It is going to go from the polar region to the polar region, and the reason for that is going to be to map the magnetic field that Jupiter has. So before this mission, there was only one mission dedicated really to studying Jupiter, and that was Galileo mission. 
And uh, Jupiter remains really a big mystery for the solar system, how it formed. And I will tell you now why that is the case. Some people started challenging this, scientists, I mean people, they started challenging this idea that Jupiter actually formed from this massive planetary core that actually was accreting through the disk and then gravitationally growing by attracting all of the hydrogen and helium. The reason for that is that this needs to happen really, really fast if we want uh, Jupiter to grow. The reason why this needs to happen fast is that the stars, when they form very quickly, within like 100,000 years, they become really active on their surface and they start pushing all of this material that is in the solar nebula, hydrogen and helium, away. So for Jupiter to grow fast, it actually needs to do that in few million years. And some scientists have done <coughs> models where they challenge that this is possible to happen, basically, in this standard model. And the second model then appeared that offer alternative scenario how Jupiter would form. And that second model would say that, you know, something made that big cloud to start collapsing, but what if there was another unstable region within the cloud that start collapsing by itself as well and formed Jupiter uh, on its own? That would happen much faster. Jupiter would only take a few thousand years to form that way, so it would really quickly could grow basically and become really big. What would be the difference between these two models? How can we probe them? That is the question, and that is pretty hard uh, to kind of uh, uh, predict. But one model, the first one, the standard model, suppose, actually assumes that there is a core inside of the Jupiter, while this one doesn't really require any kind of core because it is just the collapse of the material that forms the planet. And so this theory now has a lot of support uh, in the scientific <coughs> community. Uh, because many people now doubt that it's possible to form the Jupiters via the standard model that we have. How will Juno help us? Juno will have actually, Juno is equipped with all of these very sensitive instruments that can go and carefully map the magnetic field and the gravitational field of the planet. By doing that, actually, you can probe the, then use various mathematical and physical models and probe the interior of the Jupiter. These two different models, they have different predictions how the interior of the Jupiter would look like. So Juno's data will be actually key in addressing that. If Jupiter randomly formed just like that because the cloud was unstable kind of in two pieces, maybe that's a bad news for some people because we think that Jupiter-sized planets are necessary to protect the planets like Earth from the influence of the other objects that come from the outer solar system. But if the Jupiter naturally forms further away from the star, that makes, maybe gives us a hope that if we want to look for the Earth-like planet somewhere else in some other solar system, maybe first we should find a big guardian Jupiter-like planet and then focus actually if there is an Earth-like planet closer to the sun. The Earth-like planet has to be closer to the sun because that's where the habitable zone is. That's where it is warm enough for the liquid water to exist. So that, this is one of the missions where people are most excited about the results that Juno will bring us because we hope finally we'll we understand how really planets formed in the solar system. So a few other things that Juno will do, but really quickly. Jupiter has this beautiful atmosphere that we can see all these colorful clouds that we see there, but we really don't know what is going on inside of these clouds. So what Galileo mission did previously, they had like a little probe that they actually put and it went inside of the, of the Jupiter. So it kind of a dived in through the clouds and how long do you think it survived? 80 minutes, I think it was like, or 58, I forgot. It was like transmitting like signals for something like an hour and then basically got really destroyed by the extremely high pressure as it was going down towards the interior of Jupiter and also by the extreme heat. So what Juno will do actually, it will have the ability with some infrared detector to penetrate like 200, 300 miles below the top of the clouds. So we will actually know how this atmosphere works, how turbulence goes there. We will also get the information about the temperature change and then also about the ratio of the water and ammonia, which some scientists also claim that they can use to distinguish uh, between the models of the Jupiter's formation. Finally, this is also interesting, Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field in the solar system after the Sun. The magnetic field originates in this part of the sun when the pressure is so extreme, basically, that uh, 
hydrogen is uh, broken down into electrons and then positive, basically, positive nuclei. So you have this extremely conducting medium where the currents flow and the magnetic field is produced. The magnetic field is so strong that it's actually, compared to the Earth's magnetic field, 20,000 times stronger. Because of our magnetic field and because of the solar wind that comes from the sun, on the Earth we have these beautiful auroras, right, that you can see, or the northern lights. On Jupiter we also have auroras, but they never go away, actually. They are always there, and they are uh, the size, like several Earths over here. So they are very powerful auroras, and unlike the Earth's northern lights, they are not really powered by the solar wind, but they are powered by uh, Jupiter's neighbor. This is the closest moon to Jupiter. This is Io. This is the most volcanic world that we know in the solar system. <coughs> when New Horizon mission flew by, it actually seen 36 active volcanoes. And all of these volcanoes that kind of a shoot outwards, the stuff from them gets pulled by the Jupiter's magnetic field and then accelerates, magnetic field accelerates these charged particles like electrons to the speeds of nearly the speed of, speeds of light. And that's actually where the danger comes from this uh, mission, Juno, that we have over here. And uh, people actually, if you watch these videos about the mission, they will call Juno the armored <laughs> tank. Because what they have actually over here, many of the electronics are made out of the material that is resistant to the radiation. And also, they're protected in this 0.4 inch thick titanium walls of a 400 pound vault. Even with this protection, okay, even with this armor, we have estimates that uh, most of the instruments will not really survive the full, full duration of the mission. For example, camera will be gone in like after eight orbits. The microwave radiometer will survive 11 orbits. And eventually, basically, the spacecraft will get completely damaged. And the plan that for the space probe is going to be diving into the, into the planet itself. I cannot but not mention the news from the last week. This is the, another moon that we have around uh, Jupiter. This is Europa. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, how this looks like, but this actually, these features that we see on the surface of Europa reminds us on the features that you could see on the polar ices on the Earth. So if you think about the ice sheets that are floating on the ocean kind of a beds, they would actually have this kind of a ridges that are called by the pressure underneath. And this is similar to what we see on Europa. So for a long time, we speculated that below this thin crust of four kilometers, there is like the ocean below the Europa surface. And last week, Hubble Space Telescope has produced these images where they detected water vapor or the, the, the jets, basically, of the water shooting out from the interior from, the, from Europa itself. And now I'll have, go, I'll have to go really, really fast about my second topic, and that's the planet Nine. This is one of my favorite contemporary scientists. This is Professor Brown from Caltech University. And uh, Brown previously discovered Eris. Eris was another object in the Kuiper belt that actually motivated scientists to start thinking that Pluto might not be actually a real planet, but just like one of many objects over there in the Kuiper belt. This year, Professor Brown has come up with another announcement. He announced discovery of a very big, 10 times the mass of the Earth, distant planet, very distant, 600 times as far from the Sun as the Earth is, with the orbit that it's inclined 30 degrees to the plane of the solar system. So very detailed, uh, detailed uh, description of the planet. Now that planet, here is the Pluto, that planet is further beyond over here in the Oort cloud. And, um, and uh, it took us actually a long time to discover any other object that it's in the Kuiper belt. So Pluto was discovered at the beginning of the 20th century, lived until 2006 as a planet. That's what we thought of Pluto. And then we actually knock it down from the planetary status because we found so many other objects in that Kuiper belt. For a long time, we didn't find a single one. But in the mid 90s, when we started exploring that part of the solar system, we found many other objects. And for some time, we thought that the Aries that the Professor Brown has discovered was bigger object than Pluto. Last year, when the New Horizons flew by Pluto, we actually realized that Pluto is still a little bit bigger. So Pluto is the biggest object over there in the Kuiper belt, but Aries is really close to it. And then there are other big objects as well. So that's why the Pluto is now a separate class of the objects. 
And if you want to follow Professor Brown on Twitter, he can be found at Pluto Killer, <laughs> which is like super. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So let let me try to explain how this works with the pl uh, planet nine. Uh, so what actually, as we started exploring the Kuiper belt, and once again we've been only exploring that for 20 years, we found uh, the Saturn was one of the first objects we found there. Everybody got really excited, but as we explored, we found actually several objects that have these similar orbits like the Saturn. So they're basically all kind of a pull towards one direction, and these people from Caltech actually did calculations that the possibility for these orbits to randomly basically be oriented this way or by chance is just 1%. So basically it is impossible to be just by themselves, almost like they're pushed in this orbit by another object. And they calculated that these magenta orbits, they could be really well explained if there is a planet on this orange orbit basically, and that's the planet nine that they are speculating is out there. They made another prediction, that's usually how science models work. They made a prediction, if the planet nine is there, not just that you should see this magenta objects, but there should be objects that are described in blue color over here that have these orbits as depicted. And not far, like, or not like, you know, too, too long after that, Brazilian team found actually several objects that have this type of, uh, this type of objects. And so, did I really find this planet nine? Well, the planet nine has this orbit that takes it 200 AUs from the sun all the way to 1200 AUs right now. And they made these models where they would tell you where the planet should be, okay? And so these black dots over here, or the black regions, are where we should look for the planet. Based on their calculations, the planet actually is not at 200 AUs, but it's more like at 1,000 AUs away, which makes it extremely faint. So even though this was announced, I don't know, like eight months ago, they still didn't find the planet, but it's not really that they know exactly where the planet is, but they have these regions of the sky where they think the planet is. Is, is now this a completely crazy idea? Mm -hmm. Well, it's been done previously in the past, okay? So here is Neptune. Uh, I just want to tell you briefly, Neptune was completely mathematically discovered. After Uranus was discovered, and we figured out what is the orbit of the Uranus, we've seen that there is something that tugs on the Uranus, and it doesn't really follow its orbit. It's like being, being pulled, basically, from another planet. And two uh, scientists, John Couch Adams and Urban Leverrier, they actually independently calculated where this eight planet should be to explain the behavior of Uranus. And they did it so well that when and the French guy emailed, not emailed, sorry, this was like. <laughs> <laughs> this is 19th century, I cannot think about anything that was before emails. When he, on a horse, sent a letter <laughs> to this to this German guy, the German guy was like so diligent that he basically opened the letter, went up to the telescope, pointed the telescope at the position where the French guy told him the planet should be, and he found the Neptune within one degree of that calculated location. And so planets have previously been mathematically uh, proposed, and I actually would really like if they can find this planet. This planet, just to tell you, if it's now, let's say, at 200 AUs away from the sun, that means that, you know, the planets don't give up their own light. They need to uh, reflect sun's light back at you in order to see them. So that means that the sun's light, when it reaches that planet, is like 40,000 times weaker than it is basically when you're looking here from the Earth, because they're so far away. And then that light has to come back towards the Earth, okay, for us to see that planet. And so they don't know exactly where it is, because all of these other objects that we know in the Kuiper Belt, we only knew about them for 20 years. So they really don't have precise orbits of other planets to calculate exactly the position of the other one. There is a hope. There is a telescope at Hawaii, and only if, we, if they could get like a month of time on that telescope, and it's the Japanese telescope, if they could get the whole month just for themselves, they claim they would find it. Nobody is giving them the time yet, though. <laughs> and so that ends my talk. Thank you. There are four inner planets, and then the asteroids, and then the four outer planets, and then the Kuiper belt, and then there is the Oort 
cloud. Now, both of these, Kuiper Belt and the Orcas, they're really not researched that well. So who knows what's out there? OK, thank you. <laughs> All set to go. So thank you very much, Irena, for a, a tour of almost the whole solar system. I'll try to improve our focus on Pluto and then look beyond the solar system a little bit on other planetary topics. Uh, we'll start with our update on the first trip ever to Pluto, which was the New Horizons spacecraft. I launched in 2006, and back then that was the fastest spacecraft away from Earth. But now. Everybody's always trying to build one that's better, and so then all the Junos apparently beaten it by like five times. <laughs> so, unfortunately, after it was launched, seven months later, that's when Pluto was demoted from being a planet. And the whole NASA team in charge of this mission was greatly pissed off. It's taken 10 or 20 years to get this mission prepared and going. And somebody's trying to diss Pluto already. <laughs> uh, but at least the spacecraft is launched and well on its way. Uh, nine years later, the spacecraft is finally getting there, almost there. Uh, five days before the actual encounter, we could begin to really see some details on Pluto. There are Pluto on the right, and Pluto's largest moon. Uh, Karen or Sharon, it's pronounced both ways, uh, on the left. And then upon arrival, July 14th of last year, the spacecraft only had one day to look at Pluto in detail close up. It couldn't slow down and go into orbit around Pluto, which would have been nice. Uh, the problem was that it was our fastest spacecraft ever, so there was no slowing it down. <laughs> Uh, and then one problem you run into when your spacecraft is four billion miles away from the Earth is even at the speed of light, the data being sent from Pluto to Earth is going to take four hours to get there. Uh, but four hours is nothing compared to nine years of waiting for it to get there. The other problem, though, is that it takes a long time to download the data from just one day of photographs and measurements at Pluto because the signal gets weakened on its long trip toward Earth. It spreads out over space, and so you get a very weak signal. So that means like very few kilobytes or megabytes per hour of download speed. So it's taken 13 months to get all the pictures and data downloaded, ending this month. It seems to be about five months ahead of schedule of finishing that. So. I guess they sped up the process a little bit. Uh, so they didn't just wait till the end of all this to start releasing the pictures, though. They started releasing a few pictures on the very first day of the encounter. And Pluto was just amazing from the first picture or two we downloaded. Uh, you can see the sky on Pluto here. It has a atmosphere, very thin air, thousands of times thinner than the air in this room. Uh, but it's a lot of nitrogen, a high percentage of nitrogen there, which makes it actually a little similar to the air here, which is 78% uh, nitrogen. Uh, we also notice there's some other gases mixed into the atmosphere too, especially methane and the ultraviolet light from the sun, what little of it there is that gets out to Pluto, uh, acts upon some of the methane molecules, breaks them up into atoms, and then reconnects the atoms with other molecules to make complex molecules that create some of these layers of haze that you see floating above the surface. Uh, looking more closely, we've seen a few faint signs that there are sometimes clouds, uh, especially this one here. There's been a couple other possible maybe clouds in a few pictures too, but very, very few. It's mostly just a blue sky all the time. Let's examine the surface. Uh, right away, we confirmed uh, a lot of what we already knew from Earth. We knew that these objects, both Pluto and its largest moon, are made of various types of ice and probably have rock toward the center, some of the heavy material that sank inward. 
Uh, on Pluto, there's frozen nitrogen, frozen water ice, uh, methane ice in smaller amounts, and even a little carbon monoxide. On Charon, or Charon or Charon, uh, that's mostly water ice. There's no nitrogen around, there's no atmosphere. It's a little different. Uh, but we pay particular close attention to this bright area, which we could kind of barely make out from Earth with the Hubble telescope. We saw a little bright spot or two on Pluto. It seems to have a heart shape. Um, the whole white area is a heart shape, but this other, this part of the heart here, sort of round portion, seems to be an impact zone, or something huge hit Pluto in the past. Uh, something maybe 50 miles wide, perhaps. Uh, so a gigantic impact. Uh, and it's a very depressed area of the surface that is now filled up with some ice inside. Uh, you see these darker areas? Uh, those are not ice. That's a little bit of the surface that's not one kind of ice or another. Uh, this is where you have more molecules that have been altered by ultraviolet light from the sun. And so you get this burnt color to them. So a little bit like a suntan, but worse. <laughs> if your skin gets that dark, you're kind of in trouble as it started out uh, this white originally. Now looking around Pluto, we started to find interesting geological features right away, including surprising mountain ranges. Uh, ice, most kinds of ice, is kind of weak sort of material. You wouldn't try to build a 25-story building out of ice. There's a couple ice hotels we have here on the Earth, but they're like one floor. Ice isn't very strong on the Earth. Uh, but Pluto is a much colder place. And we had a couple of uh, interesting uh, things here. One, the ice pretty much has to be water ice in these mountains, uh, because at these temperatures, at least water ice becomes a lot stiffer and harder, and it can actually be piled up really high <coughs> without collapsing. So these mountains rise up over 11,000 feet tall. But the other interesting thing is, is that uh, when we look at them, they don't look like they've been damaged by too many meteors and small asteroids hitting them from space. And the outer solar system has lots of small objects around that can run into Pluto, especially things that are you know, maybe 50 feet wide, and those would make good craters uh, on Pluto. And so if you see an area of Pluto like this where there aren't any craters, then that means the shapes that you're seeing were made more recently in history. But at this time in history, Pluto is such a really cold place, colder than it when, when it was first born, that we're really surprised that there'd be any signs of recent geological activity that could push up mountains out of the ground, like this. Uh, so maybe there's been some kind of a recent upheavals of flowing materials underground, some combination of ice, maybe lubricated with some liquids of some sort, uh, rising up and creating mountains on the surface. Uh, but there's more signs of geological activity we find, not just these mountains here, if we look at another part of Pluto's surface, uh, you see a big spider here, lots of uh, legs. Uh, these are giant cracks on the surface of Pluto, and they all seem to radiate from one spot in the center here. The longest one is uh, 360 miles long, so that's a pretty deep crack. And they look like cracks where the ground split open. It's not like you had like, liquids flowing through here or something. It looks like more of a split in these cracks, a fracture. We think that material coming up from inside Pluto was warm and fluid and rising, was light enough to rise with heavier materials around it sinking in some manner. And the material tried to poke up through the surface of Pluto, uh, but it didn't have enough to do it. Uh, maybe the material was getting too cold as it got close to the surface of Pluto. Uh, as you go out from the center of Pluto, the temperature should get colder. Uh, 
or if some of the fluids that might have been part of that may have drained away to the side, out other cracks or something underground. Hard to say what stopped this from happening, but material was coming up and it tried to push the surface up, and that made the surface to start splitting like that. That's the leading theory. We see similar effects on other planets. Uh, this is a picture from Venus, a much hotter place. For Venus, there's a lot of evidence that there is a lot of hot magma or molten rock underground. And sometimes that can be trying to reach the surface, being squeezed up from inside the planet, and it tries to poke out and fails. So instead, you get all these cracks radiating from one spot. But what if this had broken through? What if all the stuff came gushing <coughs> upward? Uh, what might we have found? Well, if we look elsewhere on Pluto, there's signs of material that made it out of the ground. If we zoom in on this little area here, magnify it, you see this huge mountain that looks almost like a tire, I guess, a big giant hole in the middle. And it's about 13,000 feet tall. We think it's an extinct volcano, or maybe not extinct, actually. Uh, really tall and then it's about 90 miles wide if you go to the very edge over here and the very edge over there. And when we look around here we've only found one tiny crater around these areas here so it looks like this is a recent construction on Pluto's surface. It hasn't been bombarded, hasn't been bombarded for very long by stuff from space. Uh, so whatever activity was building that, uh, maybe it's it wasn't that long ago, and maybe it can even go off again. Maybe more material can come up. So we're wondering what could be the source of all this like liquidy stuff, which would be probably some kind of ices mixed with liquid, very cold material, uh, but depending on the material, not cold enough to just be frozen, uh, that it can be liquid or partially liquid in some way. Also, what kind of material would it be exactly coming up? Well, let's look for some other clues. Looking elsewhere on the surface of Pluto for clues, we notice some giant chasms or, or valleys where, again, it looks like the surface split open, but not, uh, not quite the same sort of cracks we saw before with the spider because these are not all radiating from one spot. Uh, to try to figure out what's going on here, I could ask you, when water freezes, what else does it do? Swells. Yeah, it expands or swells under normal conditions. It's possible, since we see a lot of these cracks all around, that there has been, at least in the past, maybe even still, some kind of underground water ocean on Pluto and that it's been gradually freezing as Pluto gets colder inside uh, from the time it uh, was born. Uh, as water freezes underground, it has no place to go. The easiest thing it can do is to push the surface of Pluto outward to make room for itself to expand. And when you do that, then you get these splitting effects on the surface. And if it's not just in one spot where you have liquid under the surface, then you're not going to get the cracks radiating like a spider like that. Uh, you're going to get more broad parallel cracks. I'm going to try to save questions uh, to the end so that we can, uh, Irena and I can answer probably a whole bunch of questions at once. <coughs> Thank you. So we think that the ground is splitting here probably from the water underground freezing if it's really there. Uh, early analysis before we even came to Pluto was that we thought that sure maybe Pluto had an ocean in the past underground. There's lots of water ice in this part of the solar system and all planets and dwarf planets like Pluto uh, would be warm enough when they're young to have liquid water. Uh, so and maybe there's some underground. Uh, but calculations indicated that Pluto is so small and would cool off so easily it would have less radioactivity inside to keep it warm, uh, that all of Pluto should be solid ice by now. But of course, those are often estimates we make with just a few numbers. Uh, in geology, 
planets, and dwarf planets are very complicated places. So maybe there could still be some liquid underground to explain some of the features we've just been looking at, like that fresh uh, ice volcano we saw a moment ago. So well, we wonder if there, the ocean is still freezing today, that hasn't been done freezing yet. And one thing that could help it survive longer, so that it still has a little liquid left, is if it's mixed with ammonia, which is a kind of a molecule that acts as an antifreeze. If you mix ammonia into water, and you try to freeze the water, you're going to have to lower the temperature far below zero, down to minus 40, maybe minus 50 uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius, either one, uh, to try to get water to freeze. Uh, so ammonia could be helping keep this uh, <coughs> water liquid, as well as any other impurities that could help out too. And as the water freezes, <coughs> whichever groups of water molecules have the few, fewest ammonia atoms or ammonia molecules near them probably are the ones that freeze. And so by process of elimination, the water that's left probably has a higher and higher concentration of ammonia over time. So the process of freezing slows down more and more and allows Pluto to keep its water for longer. But then, in the past few months, scientists have been doing a few more calculations. They've looked at how deep underground they estimate the ocean water would have to be to still be there, or to have been there for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> and the, they calculate the weight of all the ice above, and what that would do. And the indications are that if Pluto's ocean completely had frozen over by now, that after that, all of Pluto would be gradually shrinking. All this fresh ice sitting under layers of other ice would be getting crushed from the weight of the layers above it. Uh, and given the calculations of how much gravity Pluto has and so on, a lot of that ice deep underground should have started to convert into a type of water ice called ice two. There's actually about nine types of ice made of water, uh, depending on temperature and pressure. And so under here, it would be ice two. There's ice nine, there's ice seven, there's a lot of different kinds. This would be Roman numeral two. And that kind of ice, when it's made, it shrinks. And so the inner layers here should have been collapsing and shrinking inward. And then the surface of Pluto should show signs shrinking on the outside, too. So that's what their calculations are, are indicating. Now, with any kinds of scientific studies like this, you have to wait a couple of years sometimes for other scientists to challenge some of the steps in their calculations and their logic and so on. So we'll see if that uh, bears true over time. But let's look at planet Mercury for a moment for comparison. Uh, you see these long cliffs here. We see these in a lot of places, even right here, around Mercury. And that's because Mercury, in its history, has been cooling down. And some of the magma inside turns to rock and metal. And uh, Mercury has been shrinking by a few kilometers on each side, all sides. And so that causes the weaker parts of the ground to collapse inward and the stronger parts to kind of get thrust out slightly. And you expect this kind of scalloped shape to the cliffs. So we've been looking around Pluto for that, and we see no signs of that at all. So this is more arguments that likely there still is an ocean that hasn't completely frozen solid down there. That even if some of the outside of Pluto is trying to shrink, there's still more water freezing to push it back up so that there's no overall shrinkage from that crushing effect. Uh, so you don't see any of those scarps or scalloped areas. Now, this means Pluto joins quite a list of objects in the solar system, and I've left a couple out by accident here. Uh, Pluto likely has an underground ocean, but so do a lot of other objects. Uh, Sharon, or Karen, by the way, looks like it used to have one. There's a lot of cracks in the surface. Uh, 
that show it was expanding from all the freezing. Uh, Charon or Charon has less gravity than Pluto though, so we don't expect shrinking and, and ice to turn into ice too there. Uh, but, so there's no evidence that there's a current ocean on, on Charon. Uh, but uh, Saturn's moon Titan, which has a thick atmosphere, thicker than the air in this room, uh, that seems to have an underground ocean. Uh, and just in the last couple of days was an announcement <coughs> of a survey done of the force of gravity surrounding Saturn's moon Dione, indicating that deep, deep underground it has a, a layer of liquid water about 40 miles deep, like five or seven times <coughs> deeper than Earth's oceans. Uh, so a lot of water in that moon, but it's really deep, so you don't see too many signs on the surface, just a few. Uh, and then uh, Saturn's moon uh, Enceladus has geysers shooting out into space. And you just heard from uh, Arena that just in the past few weeks we noticed plumes, smaller amounts of material coming out of Europa, uh, Jupiter's moon with all the cracks around it. Uh, and just in the past year and a half we've examined the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, Cirrus. And it shows a lot of signs that there's some kind of partially liquid layer underground there with one very suspicious looking mountain that looks like an ice volcano. And when we find uh, water in the solar system that's liquid, it always gets us thinking maybe this is a place that could be some kind of life. Uh, there's billions of different species on the Earth of so many different kinds uh, that we haven't even cataloged. So many differences and yet all these kinds of life require water, carbon atoms, source of energy like sunlight. Uh, and so as we look around the solar system, we try to find places that first have liquid water. Uh, carbon's usually pretty easy to come by, like there's methane on, on uh, a lot of these places that has carbon atoms in it. And we look for a source of energy, which for Earth it's the sun, uh, but for some of these places it's whatever is warming up the water and keeping it liquid. So that's an ongoing story. Uh, let's look a little more around Pluto. <clears throat> I can't resist this heart here. I'm a big softy for that, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> let's take a closer look at it. Um, overall, it's really, really smooth. There's no craters. But there are other kinds of holes. All these pits, they're each like a mile wide, two miles wide in cases. Very similar in size to each other. If these were craters, they wouldn't all be exactly the same size, or so close like that. They'd have a different shape. Here's another picture of some of those huge areas of this, <coughs> these holes. And we think that these pits have formed from the roof of ice collapsing, falling inward, disintegrating, and that part of what weakened everything there is a process called sublimation. And some of you probably know what that word means. It's when ice turns into is what? Yeah, gas. Yeah, gas. Uh, if you have low air pressure somewhere, a lot of different kinds of ice, including nitrogen ice on Pluto and other kinds of ice, can turn directly into gas. And it can happen on the Earth, too. Here we have the top of or part of the highest mountain in South America. There's a little bit of glaciers and snow up here. And it's actually turning into gas here, uh, coming off the land. This film is a little sped up. You can see periodically a little guy that comes running around here really fast. <laughs> yeah. And here's Mars. Uh, we see a lot of pits on Mars, but these are like uh, 100 times smaller than the pits on Pluto. But we still think they were caused by a similar process of frozen carbon dioxide in the ground uh, turning into gas, as it does seasonally on Mars. Uh, so we've seen some of these kinds of things before elsewhere in the solar system. Uh, but here's something we haven't seen elsewhere in the solar system. And part of that giant heart of very smooth ice uh, we see some of its flowing, actual shape showing flow. And we see these polygon shapes, multiple sided figures. Uh, technically, polygons look like this, but uh, these remind us of that. 
And so we began to try to figure out what's causing those shapes. And the leading idea we've come up with, let's see how well this came out, is it's a process called convection, although going up very extremely slowly. Convection is something that happens to any material if it's flexible and can flow if heat is trying to get through it. And normally, heat can get through material just by conductivity. Like if you touch something cold with your hand, heat comes out of your body quickly and enters whatever you're touching. Uh, but in some materials, he has a hard time conducting. And you can calculate a special number for your material called a Raleigh number, depending on its uh, density and temperature, uh, viscosity, and, uh, and also its heat conductivity. And calculate if a material is going to be able to conduct heat, or is it instead going to have the heat affect it, and the heat makes materials expand and become lighter. And then they start flowing upward, floating up. And then heavier materials sink down. And then they get warmed up, and they flow upward. And you get this churning effect. And depending on the materials, depending on the materials, you can get different shapes to these, often very polygon types of shapes, sometimes hexagons, like in this diagram here. Uh, with Pluto, you also have sort of a flowing effect in this direction. So that might be affecting some of these shapes, altering them a bit as well. But we think that there's some kind of convection going on there. Uh, I'm skipping a couple slides that uh, go on to what tests we've done to calculate if convection can really happen there on Pluto in that particular ice. We figured out the ice moves at only a few inches per year. But it's still rising up, and it's spreading out, and it's sinking down <coughs> with each of those polygons. Uh, the ice looks like it's deep enough uh, from its ability to cause mountains at the side of the depression to get dislodged and float up. Uh, so there's a lot of analysis we could go into on that. But it looks like there is some convection there, uh, which brings me to the next question about that heart of ice. Uh, where did all the ice come from to fill up that big depression or basin? Uh, until very recently, the last couple of weeks, all the talk was about liquid nitrogen coming from some source deep underground, uh, coming up into the center of that depression, and then flowing and churning and all that. And then some of the ice that's flowing and churning evaporates and becomes part of the atmosphere, giving nitrogen atmosphere, and then some of the nitrogen escapes into space with the solar wind sculpting it off. Uh, but that story is kind of falling apart a little bit. Uh, we don't think that the, uh, all that ice came from below after all, just at least according to this uh, article in the last couple weeks in Nature, which is one of the most uh, prominent science uh, journals. Uh, it looks like the, the, all that snow and ice came from above, that it came simply from the air as snowfall and frost and also glaciers that are flowing in from the side. These are some highlands or uplands uh, where snow lands here, forms big glaciers of nitrogen, and the nitrogen ice slides into the heart. This is that heart area again. And it even dislodges some chunks of water ice, some of these hills come loose and are carried inward. Uh, water ice, you may remember, is usually pretty light compared to rock and other things. Uh, nitrogen ice is heavier, so it, it can uh, gnaw at the edges of the water mountains and eventually break them free. And we see these chains of hills following the flow into the giant basin. So this new paper is saying that uh, when the depression first formed, it's so low in altitude that there's more air pressure there. And it's going to act as a trap for any, any uh, cold air coming in. It's going to start freezing, turning into frost, start piling up layers. And any glacial materials that come in and fill it will tend to stay. They won't evaporate or sublimate too much. And so you can constantly keep a 
big supply of this uh, icy flowing nitrogen uh, in there. Uh, those authors pointed out to Mars how Mars has its own deep depression caused by an asteroid that struck Mars probably billions of years ago and seasonally a lot of carbon dioxide from the air freezes and snows into that basin called the Hellas Basin. Now, Mars's atmosphere is almost all carbon dioxide. When it gets cold enough, uh, during the southern winter in particular, when it's winter down here, and Mars happens to also be at its furthest point from the sun, it gets really cold, and the sky starts falling. The, the air turns into these uh, ice crystals or snowflakes, but they're much smaller than any snowflakes on Earth. They're about the size of a red blood cell. So that would be a much different experience than a snowstorm on the Earth. And then all of it just disappears in the spring when the south warms up. Uh, my final topic is we move much further beyond Pluto, almost 7,000 times further than Pluto. And we're going to look at the discovery of a new planet announced just a few months ago called Proxima b. What is our word, I know some of you know, uh, from astronomy courses, for any planet that does not orbit the sun? It's exoplanet. Right, an exoplanet. Right there. Exo means beyond. So these are planets beyond our solar system. And the first exoplanets were found in 1991 orbiting around a dead star. Uh, so not even around a real star exactly, but four years later we found them going around real stars too. Um, one of the ones around dead stars actually now has an official name of poltergeist. Because uh, the star is dead, and, and the other two planets now have official names that are around similar topics of, of zombies and death. Uh, but let's explore this part of the sky here. This is the constellation of Centaurus. We can see part of this from San Diego in the summer or spring. Uh, and the brightest star here is Alpha Centauri. There's another little star there, Proxima Centauri. Uh, looking more closely, Alpha Centauri turns out to be two stars, A and B. And here's Proxima Centauri way over here. Uh, but these stars are, are uh, they're the nearest three stars to Earth. And so we can see a huge gap between uh, this star and these two, uh, this gap looks a lot bigger than the gaps between like these other stars here because it's so close to us, only four light years away. Uh, and calculations indicate that this third star does orbit around the other two, but it takes over a million years to go around them. There's still a tiny chance that our calculations are wrong and that it doesn't even orbit the other two stars. And this one is actually slightly closer to us than those two. So that's what. So here's what it would look like from another angle. You have Alpha Centauri A and B orbit around each other there, and Proxima Centauri follows the much larger path around both. We've searched for planets orbiting around other stars since the 1990s easily. And we've developed several different methods for finding them now. Uh, one of them is called the radial velocity technique. I've had to delete a slide going into a lot of detail on that. Uh, but what's happening there is if you have a planet orbiting around another star, the planet has a force of gravity, and it tries to pull on the star. You usually think about how the star pulls on the planet and makes the planet keep going around in an orbit around the star. But planet, with its weaker gravity, at least tugs a little bit on the star and makes the star seem to wobble a little bit or swivel around. And so we looked at uh, Proxima Centauri and we detected that that star does seem to have a little swivel as if something is influencing it. And as the star moves a little toward us, its light waves get a little scrunched together and they end up looking a little tiny bit bluer in color. When the star is moving away from us, uh, the light waves that are coming from it to us get more spaced apart, longer distances from between points of intensity. 
a longer wavelength, we say, in physics, and uh, the light would look slightly redder as the star moves away. But it's a tiny, tiny shift in color. And we've detected this star seems to vary in its speed, moving toward and away from us, only by about 5 or 10 kilometers per hour. So about the speed that you walk at. And so that requires tremendous technology to detect something moving at that slow of a speed four light years away from us. Uh, but by analyzing this curve of data where we fit mathematically uh, this curve to the data, that indicates that there's a planet reasonably similar in size to the Earth or mass as the Earth has orbiting around Proxima Centauri. And it takes 11 days for the planet to go around the star. We see that the wobble of the star goes from moving away from us to moving toward us, then away from us again in a cycle of 11 days. So for a, and we nicknamed the planet Proxima B for the time being. It may get a new name a number of years from now. Uh, maybe not poltergeist, but more of a living name for this one. But for now, it's named after the star that it orbits around. Since it only takes 11 days to go around, uh, we use that information with what we knew about the speed of the star and the mass of the planet to calculate that the, the planet is at a distance of 0.05 astronomical units away from the star. So the planet follows this little dashed line, and the star is right there. I'll describe this zone here a little later, uh, but to give you an idea how small 0.05 AUs is, if you put the sun here instead of Proxima Centauri, then planet Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, would be way out here. And Mercury is a pretty hot place. On one side of Mercury, it's about 800 <coughs> degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so imagine if Mercury was this close to the sun, it would be even hotter. Uh, however, fortunately for this planet, this star is not as bright as the sun. So it has a harder time making planets nearby very hot. So our sun would scorch it, but this star is 670 times less bright than the sun. And you could kind of tell that on those opening slides where you saw Alpha Centauri looked real bright and Proxima looked like this tiny little red dot. Uh, let's look at that hashed area, zooming in, the planet going around the dashed line. Uh, this dashed area is the area where the amount of light coming from the star here, estimating the amount of light that comes from the star into this area, that tells us that any planet in this area would have a pretty moderate temperature, the kind of temperature where water would usually be liquid instead of freezing and turning to ice, or boiling away and turning into gas. We call this the habitable zone, uh, because, as one of you was bringing up uh, that term, the habitable zone, that's just the place that has liquid water, or most likely could have liquid water uh, for planets there, uh, if there's any water on the planet at all. And water is important for life, so it means this kind of place would be habitable for life and life, perhaps, is present on this planet there. It's going to be a while before we can check, because this planet is so close to the star that you can't really see the planet itself to see what it's made of and see if there's water or life on it. So we wonder life might be possible. And here's an artist's drawing of what this planet might actually look like. So here's the size of the Earth. And this is about what Proxima b would look like uh, if we have its size right. We estimate this planet's about 1.3 times as heavy as the Earth. Uh, but there's a chance that it weighs a little bit more. If its orbit around the star is tilted significantly compared to our vision, then we're probably underestimating the mass of the planet. It could be two, maybe even three times as heavy as the Earth. But most likely, it's pretty close to 1.3. Uh, calculating from the fact that it's heavier than the Earth, 
and ha but also it has more gravity than the Earth. We've been able to estimate how much space it takes up. It probably has a diameter about 10% greater than the Earth. Again, possibly a bit more. Since this planet is really close to the star, it's going to be affected by the star's gravity, which causes a bit of a stretching and squeezing effect on a planet called tides, or tidal forces. Same thing the moon is trying to do to the Earth, stretching the Earth's oceans and causing high tide and low tide. Uh, but in this case, it's a star trying to do it to a planet. And the closer the planet is to the star, the stronger of an effect. And if the planet has a fairly circular orbit, uh, then it's by this time in its history, uh, or it's, it's actually a little older than the Earth even, it's probably pointing one side of the planet toward the star at all times. It's called a tidal lock. So on one side of the planet, you always see the star. On the other side, you never do. I put hide on this slide, but somehow it's showing it. It's showing the Earth and the Moon. I want to jump forward to uh, estimates of the temperature on this planet if it's locked. If it's always showing this side toward the star, then this side is baking at about uh, 30 to 40 Celsius temperature, so like 100 degrees Fahrenheit all day. And this side in the green looks like minus 40 degrees, and minus 40 is the same in Celsius as Fahrenheit, so whatever scale you're used to, uh, that works. So one side will always be hot, the other side cold. But we don't know if this planet really is in a circular orbit. We need better data, a little more clear data to fit, and we'll soon probably have that. Uh, but we know that every planet's orbit is an ellipse. It can be close to being a circle, or it can be more stretched out. And for this planet, the amount of stretching is somewhere between 0 and 0.35. That amount of stretching we call eccentricity. And if you, if you stretched it until you made it into a line, then that would be well, eccentricity of 1. And 0.35 is pretty significant. That's this orbit here. And you see the planet would come a lot closer to the star at times, a lot further away at other times. If it's in an orbit like this, then we think it probably has a relationship with the star that we call a 3 to 2 resonance. Uh, what that means is simply that every time the planet goes once around the star, it also turns once on its axis, or one and a half times on its axis. Or equivalently, for every three times it spins around, it goes around the star twice. So a three to two ratio. So in this kind of situation, it spins really slowly, so whenever one side is pointed toward the star, it gets a long dose of sunlight, but it, it doesn't last forever. It eventually turns and gets nighttime. <coughs> so here's a simulation of what the climate would be like as the planets gradually spin. You'd have a warmer at the equator, just like most planets, and cold near the North Pole and the South Pole. Uh, finally, last slide. Um, that star, that wimpy, tiny star that's 670 times less bright than the sun, actually is like a, a really loud infant in the crib or something. It's a type of star that's very unstable, where it has powerful storms called flares that can shoot out from the star. And this planet, Proxima B, <coughs> is awful close to the star on top of that. So there's going to be a lot of damaging radiation, uh, about 400 times the amount of x-rays that the sun emits would be coming from this star. And there'd be a, a bit of a wind coming out from the star as well. Uh, this could erode and destroy any atmosphere of the planet. Well, that could be a real problem, a problem for there being life on that planet. Hard to say. if it if it will successfully get rid of that atmosphere, if this planet has strong magnetism, like Earth, uh, not like Jupiter, like you heard, but at least like Earth has, then it may be protected and at least have some air for its uh, 
animals and creatures to breathe if it has any life there. So, and maybe life there has adapted to more dangerous levels of radiation as well. Oh, this is the last slide, actually. Here's what sunset looks like on the Earth. And here's what it would look uh, at some big lake on uh, Proxima B. Even though this star is smaller than the sun, it would look bigger in the sky because the planet's close to that star. And the star itself is pretty red in color, so the sky will look a little more orangey and red. But there will still be a little bit of blue around as well. Every planet, uh, there's a tendency toward having a blue sky because of uh, the size of molecules in the atmosphere. Just almost any kind of molecules interfere with the smaller blue light waves more easily than other colors. Uh, so, so even if it was all carbon dioxide, like Mars, we'd probably still have a blue sky. All right, we could both take uh, questions that you have. And if anybody really needs to be somewhere, uh, <laughs> just fly it.